My talk today is titled Beyond Sanitizers. Uh, but if we want to talk about something that is beyond sanitizers, I want to first make sure that uh, the audience knows what the sanitizers are. Please raise your hands who knows what these tools are. Good. Please raise your hands who knows uh, who actually tried these tools, at least one. Perfect, perfect. You're my audience. So uh, I would still remind you some of the details about the sanitizer. Hopefully I will be quick uh, today. And uh, the other two topics I want to, to talk to uh, today is fuzz testing and code hardening. Let's start from uh, the recap of my talk at CPPCon last year. So the sanitizer said dynamic testing tools based primarily on compile time instrumentation. Uh, and dynamic testing means that you actually have to run the application to test it. First, uh, the tool that appears in first in chron uh, chronological order is called ASAN or address sanitizer and it finds bugs uh, related to addressing memory. And I won't go into details of how the tool works. I will just show what it does. Suppose you have a program, and this slide has a very simple uh, C or C++ program that has an obvious bug. You uh, overflow a global buffer. Uh, all you need is to compile this application with a single switch. In this case, it's f sanitize address. And then you run the application. If the bug happens at runtime, the tool will report an error with all the details like the current stack trace, the type of the bug, the addresses, uh, and some information about memory that has been uh, accessed incorrectly. And the tool will abort after reporting an error. A little bit more fancy example is use after free. Again, the same thing. You compile uh, the program with the special switch, you run it. If uh, the dangling pointer was used, uh, the tool will report and abort. A more fancy kind of dangling pointer, we call it stack use after return. It's when you take a, an address of a local variable on the stack, you leak it somewhere into a global state, you exit the function, and then you continue using this pointer. How many of you have debugged such bugs in, in the wild? We share the same pain. Uh, <laughs> The tool can find these uh, bugs relatively, sim <laughs> relatively easily, and it will also show you uh, which local variable uh, of, an e of a function that has already exited was used. Second tool called TSAN Thread Sanitizer is about concurrency bugs. And concurrency bugs are primarily data races. Uh, this example using C11 has an obvious data race. Uh, we're accessing the same memory location from, the, from two different threads. At least one of these uh, accesses is a write, actually two on this example. Again, you compile the application with a different switch, f sanitize equals thread, you run it, and if a data race uh, could have potentially appeared in this execution, uh, the tool will flag it. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the particular data race happened during this execution. I mean that the memory accesses happened in the same CPU cycles, uh, in the same CPU cycle uh, in two threads. Uh, third tool, memory sanitizer, it finds bugs related to, to the contents of memory. And uh, more specifically, it finds uh, users of uninitialized memory. If you have some memory block, either on stack or heap, uh, and if you forgot to initialize it completely, and then if the code is using this memory block in a way that it will affect the program execution, uh, the tool at runtime will report this fact to you. And it will also show you uh, some details about the memory location in, in question. If this is a stack variable, it will show you the function name and the name of the variable on the, on the call stack. If it's a heap, it will show you the heap allocation stack trace. Finally, last but not least, UBSAN, which stands for Undefined Behavior Sanitizer. 
it finds many, many, many other uh, kinds of undefined behavior. In fact, UBSAN is, is, is not a single tool, it's an umbrella for a couple of dozens of checkers uh, that do different things. And I will show you just one of them. The, the most obvious, the, the most well-known kind of bug, integer overflow, signed integer overflow. Uh, if you have that in your program, if it happens during the execution of a test, uh, the tool will report uh, to you the place in the program where it happens and the actual values uh, that, that are part of the integer overflow. Uh, the next slide is prepared by the marketing uh, team of the sanitizers group. And it says what it says. Sanitizers has, have found thousands of bugs everywhere. Uh, everywhere we tried, everywhere our users tried, etc. And there are some proof links if you want to go for, uh, later offline. Uh, but the sanitizers are not enough, and we've learned it in a hard way. Uh, we've been applying uh, the sanitizers to many of our applications, uh, finding tons of bugs, releasing the applications into production, and catching more bugs in production in a hard way. Uh, this is because of, of the two fundamental problems. First, the sanitizers are only as good as your tests. And the tests actually tend to be bad, unfortunately. And, and second fundamental problem is that the sanitizers being dynamic tools, uh, they're not any kind of proof of correctness. Uh, they're just best effort tools. If you find a bug, you know you found a bug. And if you fix the bug and the report disappears, you most likely fix the bug. But if you don't find any bug, it doesn't give you any information. You may still have a couple. So we needed to, to do something else, to, to extend the way we use the sanitizer, so maybe to, to implement something different to, to protect ourselves from, from the bugs. And, and there are many, many ways to, to do this. I will just talk about two things. First, we need to somehow improve the test quality, or in other words, test coverage. And one of the ways to do it is called fuzzing. Uh, the second thing I'm going to discuss today uh, is called code hardening, and it is a way to protect your code in production in the assumption that you still have bugs. You, you don't know where these bugs are, but you know that there are some out there, and you need to protect uh, your security uh, uh, from these unknown bugs. Okay, the first part is fuzzing. Who knows the term? Good. Uh, and this is what Wikipedia has to say about fuzzing. Uh, essentially, it is feeding random garbage into your application and trying to observe what's, what's going on. Whether it will crash, whether it will hang, whether it will consume enormous resources, or so on. And the, the fuzzing methodology has been known for many years now, and there are subclasses of, uh, of fuzzing, in fact. Uh, one of the very popular ways of fuzzing is called uh, generation-based. Uh, it is when you generate random tests or uh, partially random tests based on, based on some rule. Of course, such fuzzers can and should, in fact, be used uh, together with the sanitizers so that you, you, when you run a random test, uh, you actually check for all kinds of uh, undefined behavior. When you generate uh, inputs, sometimes a good strategy is just to generate sequences of, sequences of bytes. Uh, and most of them will be illegal uh, for the particular target application, which is fine. You will stress the, the ability of the application to handle illegal data. Sometimes, however, you want to generate only legal data. And this is much more challenging because then you need to, to build some kind of specialized logic into your generator. Uh, it is often very, very convenient to generate, uh, to generate valid data in the fuzzer. And as an example, one of my favorite fuzzers of this kind is called C Smith. It's a fuzzer for C compilers. It generates 
valid but very, very random C, C programs. You can compile them, you can run them, and there is no single compiler in the world that could stand a uh, good week of fuzzing with Sysmet. Uh, at least this was a year ago. Most of the obvious bugs were fixed since then. Uh, the same, uh, the, the, the approach of generation-based fuzzing uh, is very heavily used in industry, uh, including the sec Chrome security team. And this particular way was, uh, was used to find many thousands of bugs in the Chrome browser. <coughs> so it's extremely effective and efficient, yet it often barely scratches the surface of, of your application. Another completely different approach to fuzzing is called mutation-based. Uh, the idea is that you somehow acquire a test corpus, a set of valid or almost valid inputs for your application. You often just crawl the web to, to get the inputs of your particular type. Then you want to minimize this corpus, because if you crawl the web, you'll probably get too many duplicates, too, too many uh, inputs that are not different from each other. You want to minimize the test corpus according to some metric, <coughs> and the most obvious metric is code coverage divided by execution time. So you want the tests to be small and very quick, but also you want the tests to cover as much functionality of your program as, as you can. The next step of uh, mutation-based fuzzing is that you start mutating the tests in the corpus and uh, run them. Of course, again, it's, it's best to run them uh, with some kind of runtime checking, sanitizers or something else. <coughs> and in our experience, this kind of uh, fuzzing very often gives much better coverage, much, much better results than just generative fuzzing. Of course, it, it actually depends on, on, the, uh, on the target application. What exactly are you fuzzing? Uh, if, for example, you want to fuzz a C++ compiler, uh, pure mutation-based fuzzing may be less efficient uh, because it will most likely produce lots of invalid C++ programs and all you will be testing is like Lexer or at best Parser, not the, uh, the interesting layers. The next step for mutation-based uh, fuzzing is what we call control flow uh, guided fuzzing or sometimes coverage guided fuzzing. It is the sa same thing as uh, mutation-based fuzzing, but with some additional steps. So first, first key thing is that you need to run uh, all the tests with some kind of instrumentation uh, that provides you the coverage feedback, that tells you where uh, the application has been running while executing this particular input. And you need to know when you've hit something new. You need to be able to, to say, okay, this input triggered some new code path that we have not seen before. Or maybe that we have seen before, but very few times. And if, and if, if this is true, if, if we found a test input that is significantly new, we have to take this test input and add it back to the initial corpus. So that the further mutations will take that uh, interesting case and mutate it again. In our experience, uh, this approach is often several orders of magnitude faster than plain uh, mutation-based fuzzing. Any talk about fuzzing nowadays, or especially about mutation-based uh, fuzzing, is impossible without mentioning AFL fuzz. Who, who have tried this tool? Who, who have heard about this tool? No, raise your hands. You've, you've all heard this, about this tool now. <laughs> so AFL fuzz. It's a control flow guided fuzzer. Uh, it instruments the, the target binary at compile time, so you, you have to have the sources. Uh, the, the regular mode instruments on assembly level, uh, and the, there is a recent edition that does it with LVM compiler. Uh, the instrumentation provides a fixed uh, array of counters, 64K counters, and the counters represent all control flow edges in your application. This, these are not, this is not exact ma mapping between counters and the 
uh, adjacent application. So there could be some collisions. Uh, the, the, the counters are imprecise, but they're still good enough and they, they uh, provide quite, quite good information to, to, to work with. Uh, the counters are 8-bit and they represent eight different states, like uh, this path was executed once, twice, three times, from four to seven times, and so on. Eight, uh, eight different states. And if uh, a given uh, input mm, unit uh, produced a new bit in this array, it means that this, this unit is interesting, we're adding it back to the corpus. The fuzzer itself, AFL fuzz, is a driver process, and the target application runs as a separate process or as a separate set of processes, depending on the, on the setup. I will not go into further details of the AFL fuzz, but what I want you to know about it is that it is not a toy. So if you have an application that is even slightly applicable, where, where fuzzing is even slightly applicable, <coughs> try AFL fuzz. This is the list of things uh, that AFL fuzz, of course this is not a complete list. It's just what was on the website months ago. I want to talk more about uh, our own baby, the, the tool we, my team at Google developed. Uh, it is called LVM LibFuzzer. <coughs> and lib here stands for two things. Uh, first, this is a library. And second, uh, LibFuzzer is actually targeted at fuzzing, at fuzzing other libraries. So this is lib twice. But first, I want to tell you briefly about uh, coverage instrumentation that we have implemented in LVM compiler. Uh, it is under the umbrella of fsanitize-coverage flag, but in fact, it implements uh, several different uh, coverage strategies that uh, complement each other. First, the obvious thing is uh, function or basic block or edge level coverage, one of these three. So, with this kind of coverage, you get the information where the given function was executed at least once, uh, given basic block or given edge. The second kind of coverage is indirect calls. It gives you all the indirect call, uh, call or call pairs uh, during the execution. And the third uh, flavor is 8-bit counters, just like in AFL, uh, which I described earlier. This coverage instrumentation can provide you feedback both after the process has exited in the form of a file on disk and as in-process API call so that you can query the current state of the coverage inside the process itself. And the way it is implemented now, the, this coverage instrumentation should be combined with one of the sanitizers. Uh, the typical slowdown of this coverage is very small usually within 10%, although the 8-bit counters may stand on the way of multi-threaded applications because uh, the counters are globals and there is contention on them. So back, back to LibFuzzer. Uh, it's a lightweight in-process control flow guided fuzzer. This is the, uh, the, the very short description. Uh, all you need to use this fuzzer <coughs> is shown on this slide. You, first of all, you need to implement your own target application, uh, your target function. Uh, in other words, a function that does something interesting uh, using the APIs you are trying to test. The, the function takes uh, as, a as a parameter an array of bytes. Uh, second, you need to compile uh, your library with, with the cover coverage instrumentation. If you don't know which coverage instrumentation you need, use, use all of them. Uh, and you need to throw one of the sanitizers into the mix. And finally, you just link with the libfuzzer library. Libfuzzer is much younger than AFL fuzz, and it is still not as algorithmically sophisticated, yet it is quite capable, as I will try to show you. Again, it is not, tar it is not targeted at fuzzing large applications. It is not good at it. It is targeted at fuzzing 
small, well, small medium-sized libraries and APIs. Suppose you've built a fuzzer, how do you use it? First of all, you want to acquire a test corpus somewhere. In many cases, an empty test corpus to start with is absolutely fine. But if you're fuzzing some kind of uh, data format parser or some kind of application that, that uh, consumes very complex data input, very highly structural input, you want an initial test corpus. <coughs> You put the corpus in, into the directory, one file per input, and then you simply run the fuzzer like this. Fuzzer and corpus. This is all you need for the, for the basic uh, functionality. Uh, there are lots of knobs in the fuzzer, and the goal of my team uh, in, the, in the coming year is to eliminate all of the, all of the knobs and just leave the, the, basic, uh, the basic way of running. Fuzzer, corpus. But now there are still knobs that you may want to use. First of all, uh, the parallelism, how many cores you want to consume. And second, uh, the, the limit of the size of the input tests. H how big uh, uh, do you want the, unit, uh, the, the input uh, tests to be? There are lots more knobs you can get them from help. <coughs> if Flipfuzzer discovers some new interesting test input, it has been instantly added to the corpus directory. And if there are other uh, fuzzer processes running on the same machine, uh, they will pick up the, the new test inputs. If a bug is caught or timeout is detected, uh, libfuzzer will stop the process and dump the reproducer on disk so that you will have uh, the error message and the reproducer in your log file. All of it. And of course, uh, one fuzzer is always much weaker than two fuzzers. Uh, if, if, you, if you have some, some interesting application to, to test, you want to use all the tools you have. So you can take the corpus generated by one fuzzer, leap fuzzer, for example, and give it to some other fuzzer, for example, AFL. It works vice versa mm, as well. And let's go to, to some examples. <coughs> Uh, this is the thing I was playing with uh, last week uh, in preparation to this presentation. Uh, LibFreeType is an open source library for parsing and handling uh, true type fonts, uh, and actually all kinds of fonts as far as I understand. And the, the very simple fuzzer fits not just into one slide, but into a half slide. Uh, all you need is basically to pass the uh, array of bytes into the API function. This is all. Of course, if the, if the API function has created some object, uh, you want to destroy this object, because otherwise the fuzzer will run out of memory very soon. Very, very soon. Seconds. And here are the results of running this fuzzer for like three days on a single machine. Well, that machine had quite a few CPUs, but still a single machine. You can see it has all flavors of, of most of the flavors of the bugs. Uh, red are buffer overflows, the, the most <coughs> scary from security standpoint, but there are also all kinds of other things. For example, some test inputs consume 17 gigabytes of, of RAM. And I was running with, with the limit uh, of 1K. So 1K input triggers 17 gigabytes of uh, usage. And all other weird things. Uh, by the way, I should say that everything is fixed by now. The, the developers were very happy to, to see these bug reports coming. <coughs> now maybe something more interesting. Open SSL. <laughs> So the, the, the code actually doesn't, doesn't fit on the same slide. There is an init function which I have omitted. Uh, but still this is like 20 lines of code and most of it is boilerplate. I have no experience with OpenSSL. I have no clue what it is doing inside. I barely know what it should be doing outside. Uh, and, and I've took the snippets from someone else. Uh, the key point here is that all this 
all this code is boilerplate. You don't need to worry about it. All you need to worry about is that you actually pass the data and the size of the data somewhere. How many of you have heard about hard bleed? Good. Uh, how many of you believe me that uh, Lipfuzzer can find hard bleed before the end of this presentation on this laptop? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay. End of presentation is 35 minutes from now. How about five minutes? Raise your hands. Yeah, let us see. So I, I will not be compiling it, it's, it's pre-compiled here. And I will not be using any test corpus, so uh, the fuzzer will be generating uh, the inputs from outer space. It doesn't know anything about, about what it is testing, it just throws random data and receives the feedback from the coverage instrumentation. So uh, what I suggested, five minutes? Let's just wait. Done. <laughs> so this, this particular fuzzer was co uh, compiled uh, with address sanitizer. And address sanitizer reports heap buffer overflow. It says that the read was 58K, ridiculous. Uh, the read was done in mem copy, and the second, uh, the second frame suggests something about hard, hard beat. I wonder why. Anyway, uh, and this this lo laptop is is pretty weak. Uh, on a decent machine, uh, the fuzzer finds it in one second, on a single CPU. Control flow guided fuzzing is not the end. It's, it's, it's an intermediate state of, uh, of this science. And there are many, many more uh, new things that uh, we want to explore and that other teams are already working on. First of all, I, first of all, I want to mention concolic execution. And from my, my standpoint of view, this is kind of rocket science. Very complex, very, very scientific, and, and very efficient. So what, what that is? We take the application, we instrument it with some kind of tracing in it, <coughs> execute on a particular test input, and record the trace. Uh, then we need to figure out which branches in the application, which paths in the applications were never taken. And we want to actually execute those paths by providing new test inputs. So we feed this data we collected into the uh, constraint solvers, and this is the rocket science part of, of the process, and the constraint solvers give us back the modified test inputs that have a good chance to, to trigger new paths in the program. This is a great thing in theory, and in fact, uh, we now see uh, great results in practice. It, it works, this is not just the theory. But still, it's, it's quite heavyweight, like if you are a medium-sized code developer, you, you may not have resources or time or uh, anything else to, to invest into this kind of heavyweight testing. I wish in 10 years there would be like common frameworks or software as a service for, for concolic execution, but not today. Uh, we're trying to find some kind of middle ground uh, between this uh, rocket science fuzzing and simple mutation guided fuzzing. One of the approaches, uh, we call it data flow guided fuzzing. So the idea is that you somehow intercept the data flow in your application, you analyze what is happening in, in the uh, comparison instructions, in switch statements, in function calls like string compare, and then you try to modify the test inputs uh, in, in hope to trigger a particular comparison to go into the different direction. And then you observe what actually happened. We have a prototype of uh, this particular idea in LibFuzzer, and also there is a very nice uh, fuzzer for the Go language, but it's outside of this conference. We already have some trophies, but uh, way, uh, a long way to, to go to a really useful thing. Uh, some of the improvements may come from uh, using taint analysis tools. Like if you know 
where the data is coming from exactly from the input, you may guide the, the fuzzer uh, more precisely. And I think I have time for a little more demo. So I will not find any bug in this demo, just something to show. So this is a G GPEG, GPEG fuzzer. It, uh, <coughs> it starts from, from an empty image. It doesn't have any knowledge about the G GPEG file format. And it tries to discover it. Well, it managed to find something. It's unusual. Often it just works like this. It, it tries and tries and tries. Eventually, it will find the valid JPEG, uh, JPEG file and will start uh, fuzzing it. Uh, but as you can see, uh, this fuzzer made oh, 100,000 iterations and didn't find anything interesting. Now, Uh, this flag enables uh, the data, uh, um, data flow guided fuzzy. And this, you, as you can see, it instantly finds some, some interesting stuff. This is because uh, the JPEG library, uh, the, the JPEG file format has some magic bytes in the headers uh, that are being compared uh, against what, what is actually in the file, right? And if we intercept the, uh, this comparison instruction, if we look inside it if you know what is being uh, compared with what, we can guide the fuzzer much more efficiently. <laughs> this is the second part of my talk. And by the way, do I have any questions about fuzzing for now? Yes, please. I think it's beautiful. Oh, okay. I wonder if uh, anyone is shipping uh, executables with fussing enabled or sanitizer. Uh, not fussing, but uh, sanitizer enabled. So, f shipping binaries with fussing enabled, haven't heard about it. No, sorry, that was uh, <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Shipping uh, binaries with uh, the sanitizers enabled is possible. We do experiments with it. It, it, is not, it is not a trend. It is not a very widespread uh, thing to do. Because the sanitizers, they have a cost. First of all, the, the, the biggest cost is memory. And then there is also CPU cost. Uh, we do experiments. We, we have uh, binaries working with ASAN in production. And they're catching bugs. Please. So are there ways to make fuzzing harder? Especially to make sure that your binary, binaries are not easily fuzzable? Can you please repeat the, the first part? I fuzz my own question. OK, here we go. Um, can we make it? So typically, you do things like at the input stage of your parsing or something. You add like a lot of dead code to make sure that people have a really hard time fuzzing your application to find problems in the first place. So. Is there, are there known weaknesses in uh, fuzzing algorithms? Ah, thanks. So are there other ways to, uh, to make your application fuzzing resistant, right? Uh, I think that the, the fewer control flow you have in the application, the harder it is to fuzz it. Like if you replace uh, if statements and switch statements and function calls, with uh, some straight line arithmetic in a single expression without, without control flow, it will, it will make fuzzing much harder. Uh, for, for more sophisticated ways of fuzzing, no, you, you, you have no chance. There's one more question here. Yes, yes please. Are you working with any of the efforts to harden some of the infrastructure? One example is Linux Foundation's core infrastructure initiative. Um, or are they uh, aware of these? If not, I will make them aware of them. But uh, if you're working with them, no point in bothering them again. Are we working with the with Linux Foundation? Yeah, core infrastructure initiative. The 
Ah, CIA. Yeah. CIA uh, yeah. Yes, yes. I'm trying to, to work with Core Infrastructure Initiative. The, the idea is that we want to encourage uh, software developers uh, to use the tools I described here on a regular basis. And the key here is regular basis. Because we not just want them to, to run the tools once, find bugs, fix bugs. Uh, we want them to set up build bots with quite a few CPUs to run all the sanitizers with all the fuzzers. Uh, make sure the coverage is 100% or getting close to 100%. And that is time consuming and money consuming business. So yes, uh, I'm trying to convince CII to, to, do, to, to make it work. Good. Uh, last question before I continue. Questions a bit more practical. Um, when you showed a list of bugs that you found in that one case, uh, there was like a lot of memory excess memory usage. Uh, we're seeing that a lot as well when we're doing fuzz testing uh, because we deal with science software. Our stuff is designed to use gigabytes of memory perhaps. And the problem we're running into is quite practical. The, the address sanitizer doesn't allow you to throw STD bad alloc. So I'm, I'm partly curious why that is. Why don't you allow the address sanitizer to throw SD bad alloc? And are there plans to work around that? Address sanitizer doesn't allow ST, uh, to throw STD alloc. Uh, address sanitizer doesn't know anything about STD alloc. Uh, it knows that if uh, malloc is not able to uh, allocate a memory, it should do something. By default, it aborts. But there is a flag that makes it return null. It's not the default flag because the security, well, it's, it's a long story. But address sanitizer does support your use case with a separate flag. It doesn't throw SV bad alloc, it just returns null and nothing no, no. turns that turns Address that sanitizer null. doesn't know about uh, libc++ or libstdc++. Oh, okay. it, it works on the level of malloc. If malloc returns null, then the operator in you will throw something. If it doesn't work, we'll fix it. So let's, let's go back to, to my second part, which is code hardening. So as, as I've explained previously, no currently known methods of testing your software, including sanitizers and fuzzing, uh, are proof of correctness. So there is always a chance that uh, you have a bug in software that you don't know, which is worse. Sometimes you don't know about the bug, but the bad guys do. <clears throat> and you want to protect your application from those bugs unknown to you, but known to the bad guys. Uh, I, will, I will talk about two threats. Threat number one is buffer overflow or use of the free that would overwrite a VPTR, vir virtual pointer table, or a function pointer in your object uh, by something that the, the bad guys control. And this is not a theoretical threat. Uh, the Chrome browser was, was completely owned in this particular way in 2013. Uh, good news is that it was done by white hat hackers that showed the exploit to, to, to Google, to the Chrome developers. But how many uh, bad guys are using similar techniques uh, out there, not just for Chrome? Our solution is called Control Flow Integrity, or CFI for short. <coughs> it is implemented in the fresh version of Clang, and it requires two flags. F sanitize CFI v call, and it also relies on uh, link time optimization, FLTO. How does it work? First of all, uh, at compile time, we treat ev every disjoint class hierarchy in the C application uh, as a separate thing. Uh, we, we don't do any, any analysis between disjoint class hierarchies. Of course, since we're also using LTO, which means whole program mode for C++, it assumes that class hierarchy is a closed system. Uh, in other words, that you don't inherit uh, from one class in uh, the main binary to another class in, in a shared library that, that is separate from, from the main binary. Uh, this is a restriction. It, it makes C++ a little bit smaller. Uh, but it, it works perfectly for Chrome, and I'm sure it will work for, for many other applications. <coughs> we take V tables for every disjoint <coughs> class hierarchy and we lay out the V tables 
as a contiguous as a contiguous array. So all the V tables for a particular class hierarchy are allocated in a, in a one uh, contiguous uh, chunk of memory. And we also align every V table in that chunk by, by the same power of two. <coughs> so that when, when a virtual call happens, uh, we, can, we can do a very simple check. At compile time, we figure out what, what are the exact functions that are allowed to be called in this particular call site. And this is just from reading the standard, right? You, you can call functions of uh, the same class and you can call the functions of classes inherited from this class. But you cannot call functions from, from a sibling in, in the hierarchy or some random function out there. And at runtime, uh, we perform three checks. Range check, that we are within this contiguous array. Alignment check, that the virtual pointer is actually aligned by the power of two we, we want it to be aligned. And then a bit set lookup. Uh, and the bit set is, is based <coughs> statically at, at compile time, based on what functions are allowed and not allowed. It may sound a little bit complicated, like three checks. Oh my God. <coughs> hmm? But <coughs> in fact, they're not, they're, they're not that complex. First of all, because <coughs> Bitset is one of the best, probably the best and the simplest data structure out there in the world. It is very cheap, right? It has constant time access. It requires one memory load per access. Uh, it requires very, very little memory per access. Even even that simple data structure can be optimized further. First of all, if a bit set is small, for example, less than 64 bits, you don't need to load this data structure from memory. It could be as part of immediate instruction. <coughs> then, if, uh, if a bit, bit set contains all ones, and in our case, it will be the, uh, the situation when we, we call through the head of the class hierarchy, there is no point in checking the bit set. Finally, the, uh, finally, we do some, some optimizations uh, to reduce the, the bit set sizes. <coughs> and we, we, we get this thing. Uh, this slide shows three, three examples of the assembly code in x86-64 that are generated by, uh, by the compiler uh, to check the validity of virtual, uh, virtual, virtual call. Uh, the blue part is the range check. It is present in all three parts and it is more or less the same. And the red part is the bit set lookup. So if the bit set contains all ones, there is no bit set lookup. If the bit set is less than 64 bits, less or equal, oop, uh, there is a bit set lookup. But as you can see, this bit set lookup uh, is just arithmetic instructions. It doesn't load anything from memory because the bit set is small and you can load it from the register. Uh, finally, if, if the bit set is big and not all ones, we, we do need to, to do this uh, memory load, but it's just a single memory load. It's cheap. Control flow integrity doesn't stop at virtual calls. We can apply the same technique, the same method to other scary things. First of all, to other scary calls. Any other non-virtual member calls of polymorphic types uh, are easy to deal with, uh, same methodology. We just check that the virtual pointer is still correct. Uh, we can apply slightly modified me mechanism to C-style indirect calls. So no C++ classes, maybe not even C++, just plain C with uh, indirect calls. We, we can apply the same me mechanism. We can also apply the same mechanism for checking uh, for bad casts. For example, uh, when a base class uh, is casted to a derived class, we want to check that the, the, the cast is correct. And also from void star to some kind of uh, pointer class, uh, we, we can check it as well. <coughs> we have um, implemented this thing in Clang LVM uh, and you need the most fresh version. Uh, and we were able to build the full Chromium browser uh, with this kind of hardening, uh, a subset of what I've described, virtual calls and all kinds of casts for today. It runs fine on Linux and Android and versions for other operating systems uh, are in flight. 
The CPU overhead is so tiny we couldn't measure it. We, we tried hard to measure it, we don't see it. Of course, if you run spec uh, for many, many thousand times with and without hardening, you will see this 1% somewhere. But on Chrome, which is multi-threaded, which does some timing related things, you just don't see it. The code size increase is quite noticeable. noticeable. It is easy to measure. And we see 7 to 8%. What was interesting is that making this work on Chromium required a huge cleanup in the Chromium code base. Uh, CFI is not a bug detection mechanism, it's a hardening mechanism, but it also finds bugs as a byproduct. And we found quite a few while try, trying to, to start Chrome with hardening. <clears throat> there are better or different ways to, to make control flow, uh, uh, control flow integrity hardening. First of all, maybe we don't need uh, link time optimization, a whole program. On the other hand, requiring LTO is, is actually a good thing uh, in many cases because LTO brings many other benefits. So I'm not sure we, we have to drop this requirement. Uh, another thing that we can change or improve or maybe not improve uh, is to allow class hierarchies to cross the, the boundaries of uh, shared libraries. As far as I understand, the, the Visual Studio two, uh, 2015 has something similar to what I've described. Uh, but it doesn't require a uh, whole program mode. I, I frankly am not sure. I, I have read the documentation uh, which says how to use it, but it doesn't say how it works inside. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe it's not a great idea to allow inheritance uh, to cross the, the boundaries of shared libraries. At least if, if your application is very security sensitive. The last, thing, the last thing I'm going to discuss is, is another threat to security. <coughs> it is when stack buffer overflows overwrite return addresses on your stack uh, by something that bad, bad guys control. You don't want this to happen. <coughs> we have solution for this, uh, for this problem as well. It is called safe stack. And again, it is uh, implemented in fresh Clank, uh, ready for you to use. It is a very simple tool. <clears throat> All it does is that it places local variables on a separately mapped region and not on the same uh, function stack that is used uh, for function calls and return addresses. It means that even if you have a stack buffer overflow in your application, even if an attacker can fully control what to write in, the, uh, in that random section, uh, the return addresses are safe. There is no way an attacker could uh, affect your return addresses. Of course, an attacker would still be able to overwrite your function pointers or vtable pointers or etc. So uh, this protection by itself is rather weak, but if you combine it with CFI, which I just explained, you get much better protection. And again, we don't see any, any performance uh, uh, loss from, from this protection, so there is almost no good reason to not use it in production. <coughs> and for those who, who like x86 assembly, here is uh, an example of what, what safe stack does. So in this example, we have a single stack variable and a single function call that takes an address of this variable. So we, we cannot uh, assure that there is no buffer overflow on this stack variable or use after return. So we have to protect it. Uh, all we do is we, we get a pointer to the unsafe stack, that uh, separate region. Uh, we update it to <coughs> so that it can be used the next time. We store it back. This is, uh, this is all in TLS. We do our stuff and we restore the, uh, the unsafe stack uh, back. This, this sounds horrible. So uh, you, you have only two useful instructions here in the application, in, in the function and lots of, uh, lots of redundancy. But in reality, this is not that bad because in reality, the functions uh, get bigger and the overhead is fixed per function, not per, per variable or something. <coughs> so again, there is no, uh, no real reason not to use this protection in security sensitive uh, 
applications. Okay, let me summarize the talk. First of all, you do not want to rely on regular testing, traditional testing, uh, because this will just give you a false sense of security. The bad guys all have these tools I've mentioned. The, the tools are open source, but I actually suspect that the bad guys had similar tools for ages, uh, based on how successful the bad guys are. <coughs> so you want three, t three things for, for your application. First, of course, I encourage everyone uh, to continue using the sanitizers. Uh, and these tools will give you basic sanity, meaning that on, on regular inputs, you will, you, you will not see undefined behavior in your applications. <coughs> However, for stronger security and just reliability, you want to use something like guided fuzzing. Uh, guided fuzzing was not simple in, in the past, but nowadays with the at least two fuzzers I've mentioned, it became really super easy. You may spend half an hour setting up, then you start the process, go to Hawaii for, uh, for a couple of weeks, you return, you get 20 bucks profit. And finally, if your application is security sensitive, you do not want to trust <coughs> these trustworthy things like sanitizers and fuzzing. You want to harden your code assuming that uh, the code still has bugs. And two of the hardening methodologies are presented uh, here are uh, control flow for virtual calls, non-virtual calls, casts, indirect calls, and safe stack for return addresses. This is not a complete protection and the, the battle continues. I hope we will win. Thank you, and I'm ready to take questions. That gentleman first, probably. Um, hi, yeah, I was just wondering, when you're using a corpus, um, I mean, some of the examples you showed were just, you know, libraries that simply took in uh, a buffer of bytes and a length, and so the format of the corpus is pretty straightforward, but I'm just wondering, with real usage, is it frequent that you need to kind of develop a, a more complex format for uh, what you would store in that corpus? So the question, what, what do we store in, in corpus and what do we do if the format is, is complicated? Yeah. Uh, sometimes we just don't do anything and the fuzzer will still find out useful things. The, the more the initial corpus, the easier the, the job for the fuzzer. Sometimes, however, uh, if, if the data format is very, very structured, it is hard for a fuzzer without any, any specific knowledge uh, to, to penetrate the, the upper layer. For example, things like XML or protobuffers or some, some structured data format. Uh, you may fuzz the parser to death, but you will not easily go into the logic uh, of the application that, that consumes XML or protobuffs. Uh, this is why we have implemented support for, for custom mutators. The idea is that Okay, we don't care about the parser of, of the uh, file format. We want to go on the next level immediately. Uh, so what we do is we, uh, is libfuzzer allows you to redefine, it's a virtual function to redefine uh, the way you mutate uh, your input data. And instead of just flipping bits, you parse it using the regular parser. If it doesn't parse, you throw it away, it's not interesting. Uh, then, using either libfuzzer utilities or your own utilities, you can mutate the fields in your, in your, in your parsed data. Like, if you have a tree structure that, that was parsed, you can now mutate individual fields. You can add fields, you can remove fields, you can cross over fields. Uh, then you feed this uh, modified uh, object to, to your target function. And if you like it, you serialize it back and write a disk. Other questions? So, uh, same stack functionality. Um, does that appear to the stack on the table to be a list of conversion? Uh, is 
safe stack related to stack annotations. So operating system threads have a fixed size they can grow to and then they die. The operating, basically the page fault. Uh, does the safe stack functionality adhere to those same limits? Uh, does so the safe stack, uh, unsafe stack, uh, safe stack uh, honor the limits of the stack size? Yes. So uh, suppose uh, we, 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 we do know the limit of the current stack. Uh, what we do is we, we allocate a memory chunk of the same size as the regular stack, which may sound like we double the memory usage. But in fact, we're not, because the call stack will use smaller amount of stack, and the uh, stack for the variables will use smaller amount of memory for the variables. And the rest of the memory, uh, the virtual memory will be consumed, the physical memory will not. So the, the actual memory consumption, in addition to the regular one, is very small. Do we store spill temporaries on the safe stack? No, spill temporaries are not even visible at the time we do instrumentation. And so spill temporaries are generated by compiler and stored on the regular stack. So at what point then do we When do we do the instrumentation for the safe stack? Uh, we make it very late at the LVM optimization stage before the low level code generation. So all optimizations have been done like lining everything, uh, but uh, things like uh, register locations uh, has not been even started. For the for this new stack, do you need a register as a stack pointer? Um, maybe say it again. Uh, if you have a new stack, you need a stack pointer as a register for that new stack. So do you have another dedicated register to that? Uh, so does safe stack require an extra register? Yes, it does. And uh, we, we don't give any special register to safe stack. It's just what the compiler decides to use for, for these variables. Yes, it's con it, it consumes extra register basically. Hi, so I have a question of curiosity. Is it on? Right. It's time. I have a question of curiosity. I guess I can just that. So basically, I'm wondering, can we use some of these tools to deal with hardware-related issues? The context I'm thinking of in particular is DRAM and things like Rowhammer. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that one. But it's essentially when we have a memory cells and we repeatedly read or access those memory cells and we disturb the bits in the adjacent rows in the DRAM bank. And that can lead to privilege escalation issues like if you disturb entries that happen to be page table entries, for example. So I'm wondering, can we either use fuzzing to identify issues like that or something like safe stack to protect us against these kinds of escalation issues? Can we use any of these techniques uh, to find problems in hardware? Uh, I have no experience with it. I guess that, that fuzzing may, uh, just by pure luck, find some of these. Right. But this is not a tool that is specifically targeted to find hardware problems. You know, is there any tool? Mm, no, I'm not an expert in hardware testing. Thank you. So I guess we're out of uh, out of time, but I'm still here, and I'm uh, I'm free to, to answer as many questions as as you have, uh, unless we're kicked out of the room. <laughs>